my name is uh, John Libby, and it's my privilege to be the National Director of uh, Langham Partnership UK and Ireland. Uh, so welcome uh, to the UK uh, in this instant, but I know folk are joining us from around the globe for a special occasion. Uh, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, is the centenary of the birth of our founder, John Stott. And this webinar is, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, an introduction, a celebration, a challenge. Uh, so all of us, maybe, I hope and pray, can take something out of this next uh, about an hour. So welcome, and thanks for carving out the time to join us, old friends, and I hope new. It's slightly disconcerting when you first come across Langham and talk to some folk who've been there for a while. They start talking about this character called Uncle John. And uh, I, I guess you fairly quickly work it out, but there's not many founders of global organizations that automatically achieve the title uncle with all those that come into contact with him. But such it was, and uh, I came to learn and to celebrate myself, just the, the warmth, the relationship, the commitment, um, all the anecdotes that uh, went up to make uh, Uncle John be uncle to so many. Maybe he is to you in those senses as well. He is to many folk around the world, and we'll be celebrating that in interview as we uh, go forward. I didn't really know Uncle John, certainly not as uncle. Uh, and, and I knew him once when he launched his commentary on the Bible Speaks Today uh, series that you may know. He wrote the commentary on Romans and he launched it. And you can imagine being in quite a large group, I guess 100, 200 um, theologians, scholars, um, all competing for airtime because uh, John finished his extraordinary overview, walks round to the front of the lectern and stands in front of it with his hands in his pockets and invites questions. And at that point, uh, there was a forest of hands. So John sort of uh, picked out uh, the first and a fairly erudite and complex question. Uh, John, with his hands in his pocket, slightly would say, that's a very interesting question. Uh, there are four things that I think you need to bear in mind when you ask that. Uh, and you need to look at, for instance, the use of the word sarks in so many different chapters in this, this, and this, and this. And the first thing I want to point out is this. The second is that. The third is that. And in a sense, lastly, but not least, the, the, the last thing is this. So in a few moments, he'd unpacked an extraordinary, complex, unrehearsed issue and explained it to a general audience, as well as to a uh, majority of ministers, pastors, and theologians. And that was extraordinary to my mind, never knowing that I would have the privilege of hosting something like this in his memory and in testimony to him. So just a, a word of housekeeping as we start, the, the chat box and other things are not being monitored apart from the Q&A button. Now, if you have any sort of problems or something's going wrong that you think at our end we should be alert to, or maybe you want to make a comment that could be picked up later on in the hour, then do please use that uh, Q&A um, uh, just to type in your, your question or observation. And just uh, before we start, just uh, a little bit about the structure of uh, Langham, because we're going to explore a little bit of that and help to have some framework. Um, Uncle John set up several operations uh, which seeded others. I guess there are five, well rather six now, uh, national uh, partnerships which are autonomous organizations in different countries. So in New Zealand, Australia, Hong Kong, Canada, US, UK, each has uh, an element, an organization that is part of the Langham Partnership. And so if you're in any of those countries, do hes don't hesitate to, uh, to get in touch direct. Those uh, half dozen partnerships then support and supply the resources to our three global program streams. And we operate literature, preaching, 
and scholars on a global basis. And it's those three program streams that we'd love to uh, bring you up to date with or uh, open your mind to, uh, to explore uh, at this time. So there's those six uh, national uh, organizations and three program streams. And you'll know, I hope, a lot about that uh, towards the end or by the end of uh, this hour. It will be about an hour. Uh, there are five uh, videos, uh, fairly short, um, three about uh, eight to ten minutes and a couple quite a bit shorter. Uh, so uh, we hope to make that interactive. Uh, they have been recorded in different time zones and uh, so um, we'll do our own whistle-stop tour of the world. And in fact, Langham operates in about 100 majority world countries. So we're going to take a slice round uh, the whole of the globe there. So um, we'll start in a, a few moments with uh, a, a sort of memory jogger to many, many about the impact of um, Uncle John, John Stott. And then uh, we'll take that trip. And before we do that, let's just commit the, the hour in prayer. Just uh, wherever we are, whoever we are, whatever time it is. Father, we just thank you for each other. We thank you for the privilege of spending this time in this special way in each other's presence and in yours. And we simply pray that through your spirit, you might open our hearts to what you are doing in your world, especially through the ministries that you seeded through the life and ministry of John Stott. Bless, protect us and guide us and open our hearts, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. John Stott is known around the world as a preacher of the gospel, student of the Bible, missionary to the world, best-selling author, and servant of the global church. Yet there's only one title he valued, Disciple of Jesus Christ. What is your vision of Jesus Christ? Let's have the courage to reject all unbiblical and unbalanced notions of the authentic Jesus. John Stott was born April 27, 1921. He grew up in London, where his family frequently attended All Souls Church at Langham Place. It was during his teenage years at boarding school that he was confronted with the claims of Christ and made a lifelong commitment to be his disciple. He attended the University of Cambridge, where he felt a deep sense of call to the Christian ministry. After graduation, he accepted a position at All Souls Church and was ordained into the Anglican Communion. John Stott's ministry began at All Souls, but it would gradually grow in influence on the wider world. His concern for the doctrinal purity of the Anglican Church led to the founding of the Evangelical Fellowship of the Anglican Communion. A friendship with Billy Graham led to the formation of the Lausanne movement from a shared passion to see Christ's gospel advance around the world. The London Institute for Contemporary Christianity was established under his leadership to help Christians apply the Bible to contemporary issues. His writing resulted in over 50 books covering important topics on the Christian life and the gospel. Ultimately, Stott would pour his energy and book royalties into the Langham Partnership in order to raise the standard of biblical preaching around the world. Today, Langham Partnership is a global ministry that works in more than 135 nations across the majority world, places like Latin America, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, where now 67% of the world's Christians live, yet where 80% of preachers lack formal biblical training. In these regions, Langham has developed three unique programs to equip Christ-like leaders. Langham identifies and supports emerging theological leaders through their PhD studies in Bible and theology. These scholars go on to multiply more leaders and shape nations for Christ. Langham supports local Christian leaders in creating relevant Bible study materials and they distribute books to churches, colleges, and seminaries so pastors and lay leaders can deepen their understanding of scripture. And Langham nurtures grassroots preaching movements by gathering pastors for training seminars where they learn to faithfully preach God's word. Pastors return to their local communities where they form preaching clubs to share what they've learned with others. 
Thanks to the vision of John Stott, today, Langham has helped equip nearly 400 theological leaders, distributed more than one million books, and trained tens of thousands of grassroots pastors around the world. Mission is integral to authentic Christianity. And Christianity without mission is Christianity no longer. For you and I affirm the uniqueness and finality of Jesus Christ. John Stott entered the presence of the Lord on July 27, 2011, but the influence of his ministry continues to be felt around the world through the Langham Partnership. The Langham Partnership is supported by Christians who share Stott's vision to raise the standard of biblical preaching around the world. That's the man, and uh, we're going to explore quite a bit of uh, his uh, impact even now around the globe. We'll be going uh, uh, to take the journey in a, in a few moments, but I just wonder how you sense or know the Lord, his affirmation or confirmation that you're taking the right step in uh, a risky world or, or things uh, that seem beyond, way beyond your control, how you follow guidance and how you know whether you're on the right track. Um, just before I joined Langham, I, uh, I know that I've been through the interview process um, and I was on a flight, booked on a flight, uh, a large jumbo out of Heathrow that I took the feeder flight down from Carlisle uh, to go to Phoenix in Arizona. And as I was stowing my stuff in the overhead locker, I normally go if I uh, to one of the two uh, chairs towards the rear of the large flight, I don't know, six or 700 people. And so I like to get up and walk around. So just the two where the rows of three go down to two. And as I'm stowing myself in uh, my, my stuff in the locker, uh, I throw some books down on my uh, chair next to the person who's in the window seat. And the top book uh, that I put down happened to be my refresher for the flight, which was What is an Evangelical, written by John Stott. And the person next to me turned and smiled as I sat down. He said, I know who you are. Now, this person had got on a flight from the Middle East. We'd booked totally independently, myself down from Carlisle, him from the Lebanon. And uh, it was Riyad Cassis. And I'm going to introduce you to him in a moment. But that was in a, a, a tremendous affirmation to me that uh, my change in uh, vocation was uh, being confirmed. And Riyad was, uh, I mean, one of those extraordinary go God incidences that I'm sure you know as well. Uh, when you're going through uh, your spiritual journey, your life. So we're going to hear from Riyad. Riyad's in the Lebanon, and he's talking to one of our Langham scholars uh, a while back, uh, Ashish, who's over in India. Let's listen to their conversation. Hi Ashish, good to see you my friend. It has been such a long time we haven't met, but it's good to see you even through Zoom. Thank you for joining for this conversation. Thank you, Riyadh. Thank you. It's indeed a privilege to also connect with you. Uh, I know that uh, you met Uncle John Stott uh, in person and, uh, and he did encourage you to go for your PhD. When was that and how did it happen? 
Right. I heard Uncle John first time was in 1984, uh, 1974, but it was in 1978 for the first time I met one to one to Uncle John. And it was just amazing because it taught me my first lessons from Uncle John was humility. It was a, a day when he spoke from X 17 in the morning Bible readings. And I went and asked him if I could see him. because i had few questions and so i talked with him and within 15 minutes my thing was over and so i uh, said thank you very much for giving me time because i was really obligated that such a great man gives you time like this he said no no sit down and then he told me what where my plans he knew that i was teaching at ubs and so he said what are your plans so i told him i will have to have an unnecessary evil called phd <laughs> and he says don't say that uh, that he said if, uh, i told him that my heart was in pastoral ministry then he says as a pastor you may be able to serve 400 500 people if you have a large congregation but if you train 25 people how much more your ministry will be multiplied then that touched my heart and then he Uh, I was not too sure whether to come to Britain because that time Lenga was only supporting students at UK and I thought that. But uh, he persuaded and uh, Dr. Atyal, who was my principal, they both talked about it. And Uncle John only shared about me and then got me admission at Aberdeen University. So Uncle John played a very significant role in my life uh, because... he took me under his wing so to say uh, and in many sense i consider him as my spiritual father and my vivid memory of uncle john was first time i went uh, and stayed at one of the friends place and visited the mission libraries in london several times and then on last day uncle said you are going to come and we are going to have time together and then i'll drop you at king's cross station and i still remember when we went to his upper room there he was his library yeah as i walked with him through his small bedroom and then going up and then he made soup for both of us and there was auntie yeah. francis had made sandwiches so we both enjoyed but then he talked to me personally yes and he prayed with me i mean to me he was a man of prayer and he carried on that and my again something that has stayed with me was long years later in 2006 if you remember we all met him in chris's house when we had the langham scholars think tank coming together and uh, when we met him the first thing uncle john asks me is how is suzy that's my wife and how is anugra and how are you coping yeah. with arpit's home calling i mean man who has met thousands of people and for him to remember that small detail and just to be pastorally caring for you that loving care can never go away from me and to me yeah. that is what uncle john was yeah and, yes but he yeah. brought the evangelical scholarship yes. in evangelical theology on the map of the world and i think we are all products of that and i'm grateful to god for that that he had a vision vision to help people who are committed to the lord committed to the gospel committed to world and also double listening i think most of the friends who know john stott no he is double listening he taught me that that you need to listen to your context and you need to listen to god and his word and then bring that together and therefore he always said we need scholar saints not scholar academicians and i think that is my message to today's langham scholars let us not forget uncle's vision we need scholars who can go on their knees and cry out to the lord he was a man of prayer uh, you know that uh, i mean now we are almost approaching maybe 400 langham yes. graduate and scholars 
uh, working and ministering in 90 countries. Uh, of course, India has maybe now over 50. You were among the first ones in India. Wh how do you see the your PhD equipped you uh, for the Indian context? But also I know that you and I, we worked globally uh, working with many institutions in Asia and beyond Asia. Uh, I would like to know maybe two things. First, how your PhD equipped you and qualified you in a better way to serve God and his kingdom. And second, how do you see the scenery today? How do you see the need for more equipped uh, professors at seminaries and in theological education, whether it is former or informal in India and Asia and beyond? Thank you. Yes, uh, yes. to me, um, what Uncle John has left behind is this great legacy of people across the majority world who are able to stand on God's word and relating to their context, where I have reflected upon uh, theological education, which way? That Uncle John wanted us Langham scholars to have mission and ministry as our focus, not simply academia. So I think my PhD, in a sense, equipped me to keep that balance, that yes, scholarship necessary, ask right questions and understand and help people to understand. But from Uncle John's life, what I learned, particularly when you look at his writings, any simple person can understand. It's not that academic that people have to refer to other scholars in order to understand what he's saying. But that is, I think, is something what I learned even during my PhD, that write in a way, speak in a way that people can understand and relate God's word to the context in which we live. And I Thank you, Ashish. You mentioned that uh, uh, during, uh, uh, during that time, you had only the choice to go to UK uh, to do your PhD. Uh, and now we have almost half of our scholars are doing their PhD, not in the, in the West, not in the UK, not in the US, but in Africa and Asia uh, and in other, and, uh, and other regions. What is your advice uh, for us in terms of where to do a PhD? Ah, it's a good, very good question. I mean, uh, in 2006, if you remember when we met in London, uh, for the think tank. Yes. That was one of my suggestions that we start sending people because Uncle John's vision, we have equipped people. And Langham did send Dr. Sanyu Iralu to study at SIAX. Yes. And I have found that model very helpful that students study in the region where they are, but they should be given also exposure to West maybe for three months, six months, where they can use Tyndale House or some other universities where they can go and also uh, interact with professors. And I think Asbury College is doing very well with that. Yes. Inviting yes. faculty to be able to come or the doctoral students to be able to come. I think that is a good model because then people will not lose grounding in their own culture and context. Yes. Most of people in the majority world they want this integration of theory and experience, theology and formation in spirituality. And I think to Langham's uh, leadership, that, is, that would be mine that yes, we need to continue Uncle John Stott's legacy of double listening. We need to continue his legacy of making God's word relevant, be student of God's word, but at the same time, let us also listen to the context and help our graduates in the days to come to have that double listening and therefore help more indigenous uh, theologies, indigenous scholars 
come up more and more. Riyad Cassis there, who uh, runs our Global uh, Scholars Program. And um, Riyad, at the moment with his team, are just involved uh, these last few days in selecting from the 100 or more applicants, the uh, 20 or so to join the uh, cohort of Langham Scholars uh, from this uh, September, October. So if you're looking for hooks to pray about, then that might be one there. And uh, he mentioned 90 countries, and that's, of course, the scholar program. But uh, you add in the other uh, program streams and uh, we get up to uh, 100 or so, some well underneath the radar as countries go in terms of raising the profile. We're going to go to all the way to Manchester for me, which is uh, just down the uh, M6. And we're going to listen to Peter Quant, who uh, is our global uh, literature program uh, director. And uh, he's going to be talking uh, with Taras, who's over in the Ukraine. So you can tick another um, uh, time zone off, if you like, if you're keeping count. Uh, Taras, uh, I met when he was over in London just uh, for a conference about uh, a couple of years ago. And I was down to go and see the Babylonian exhibition. Many might have seen that at the British Museum and invited Taras along. And we went along very excitedly to see this uh, exhibition, which was very good. And as we were coming out, we were chatting about some of his translation work. And I said, as uh, uh, you know, does he know of the Rosetta Stone? And uh, stupid question, sure, to ask a linguistic or a scholar in that area. And he said, oh, yes, yes, yes. And I said, would you like to see it? Because it's just in this room here. I mean, it is a replica because I think the other is under security. But he said, wow. And so we went in and uh, that, I lost him for the next hour as he sat in front of uh, the crowd around the Rosetta Stone and I think tried to translate verbatim uh, off the actual lump of basalt uh, that it was. So Taras over from the Ukraine is now going to be interviewed uh, by Peter Quant, our global literature uh, director and Taras himself actually uh, he's uh, just been project managing our Slavic Bible commentary. So I commend the interview to you. Well, greetings to us. Um, it's uh, nice to have uh, a conversation with you. Uh, Taras is the regional director for Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the Overseas Council. And he was also the project manager of the Slavic Bible commentary that was published uh, by the EAAA and Langham Publishing. Taras, I'd like to ask you some questions, if I may. We haven't got the coffee in between us, but hey, we use our imaginations. How do you see Stott's vision playing out in your world today? Um, greetings, Brother Peter. Thank you. Uh, for the question, glad to be with you today. Um, I like how John Stott's vision, uh, and this is to bring people together, not only for the goal of Christian unity, but as Jesus urged, so that such unity could serve a more effective mission. And speaking about this vision, uh, in Eastern Europe and in Central Asia, in the theological and missional training of church ministers and pastors, uh, many partnerships, uh, bridge, bridges have been built between different evangelical denominations with the help of Langham preaching, Langham literature, Langham scholars. So which were deeply impacted by John Stott's vision. So in the recent uh, 20, 25 years. It's been a long time since we've been working together. Uh, what has Langham Literature uh, or Langham Publishing uh, meant to you in particular? Uh, and how has the prevalence uh, or the lack of majority world authorship impacted you and your colleagues? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I was introduced to Langham Literature in uh, 
2008, I believe. So when we started the first conversations about the Slavic Bible commentary or Eastern European perspective, uh, I would like to mention two, uh, two impacts. The first one is that uh, working with Lenham Literature and Publishing uh, for this, uh, during these years has helped me personally as a project manager of the Slavic Bible Commentary uh, to realize how significant the need of developing local evangelical authors is. And uh, my prayer is that this growing and developing hermeneutical community uh, that was literally established by, with the help of uh, Lenham Literature so we'll have a robust missional view of the church in context and that it will look uh, not so much for fixing the chaos around which we have a lot uh, as to how to see what the Lord is doing through and around us and how we can join his mission. And the second, um, frankly speaking, before the Slavic Bible commentary, uh, we could not talk about the hermeneutical evangelical community that would work together on how to apply the Bible contextually. So we had like denominational communities, but not broadly evangelical uh, community. And the CBC project uh, initiated by the London Literature has helped us as the interpreting community overcome at least three waves of differences in building partnership bridges. So this is Baptist Pentecostal, Reformed Armenian, Ukrainian, Russian uh, in recent six years. Uh, so differences. And uh, I cannot say that we uh, unified our beliefs. However, we learned how to be and work as the one in the body of Christ, uh, following also John Stott's vision for evangelical Christianity. So tell me, Taras, what was it, uh, what was the situation before 2008, uh, particularly in terms of what kind of reading material was available, uh, how did, uh, you know, what did pastors uh, read, and where did they Got it from. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I would say that uh, before two thousand eight, uh, we had lots of individuals who were working uh, on their own uh, understanding and interpretation of the church needs, uh, the national needs, like in Ukraine, in Russia, Belarus, and uh, in many other countries of the former Soviet Union. Uh, but with this hermeneutical community that resulted uh, from the Slavic Bible commentary and other initiatives, we learned to look together on what's going on around us. And I put it like in, in three uh, focuses, what's going within us as the community and uh, what we together do for the church and what the Lord is doing around us. So this observational habits, uh, not individual, but uh, corporate or collective. And uh, the Slavic Bible commentary and other books which we produce uh, together, so uh, give uh, us uh, this um, communal, uh, communal perspective and communal uh, participation in the life of the world uh, to extend the kingdom of God. Uh, not just individual voices, but as the choir, as the symphonic orchestra. And may I ask, are there now more, authentic, you know, more uh, indigenous uh, voices than there were before? Yeah, um, actually, uh, we didn't have any local commentaries written by the locals, except for Greek Catholics, some Orthodox, and maybe some very, very popular uh, commentaries written on some books of the Bible by, by individuals. But now we have the Bible commentary, which uh, we know is used a lot by youth leaders and preachers in practically all of the countries of the former Soviet Union, in the immigrant circles, in Germany, in the United States, in Western Europe, and uh, working on, the, uh, the, on this uh, set of other theological monographs. So we, uh, we want to serve uh, with uh, our contextual understanding of the Bible. Ah, I love it. Uh, what would growth have you seen in majority of authorship as a result of uh, your activities uh, and as a result of these kind of communities that have been forming? Yeah, uh, speaking about the growth, um, 
I think I would mention uh, at least three uh, three initiatives, uh, three uh, directions. The first one is that the Slavic Bible Commentary Initiative, uh, because this is more than a project for us, so help it us unite more than 90 local authors into a hermeneutical and learning community that seeks uh, to apply biblical theology contextually. Before that, we didn't know as that many authors. We knew just several, but now we have more than 90 that are capable to write and are willing to learn to write. Uh, the second is that this um, hermeneutical evangelical community has been extended uh, with two other initiatives which arose from the Slavic Bible Commentary. This is Central Asian Bible Commentary, where we have about 60 people, new people involved, and Central European Bible Commentary. So the countries which uh, used to be under the influence of the Soviet Union uh, in, in Europe. And the third, um, uh, I would like to mention um, the third opportunity to grow. This is a new initiative that is in the process of developing uh, Eastern European Book of Theology. And its purpose uh, is to assist local pastors and preachers with biblical theological reflections on various contemporary challenges in their ministry contexts and sharing the gospel. And this community is like, again, uh, the outcome of the Slavic Bible and Central Asia. So I would name it as the third wave of development of this uh, hermeneutical evangelical community. You could say that the Slavic commentary has been a a real springboard uh, into uh, a very deep theological sea, as it were, you know, where many of the contributors all of a sudden uh, have been found and are willing to contribute together. Uh, as there's just such an encouragement. Peter Kronk, our Global uh, Literature Programme Director, talking to uh, uh, Taras Sova in the Ukraine. Someone asked me fairly shortly after I joined Langham, how big is it? How big are the programmes? What impact is it making? And uh, we've recently commissioned over the last few years uh, an independent organisation that assesses that impact and uh, gives us reports which we can circulate. Don't hesitate to ask if you'd like. They're in our annual celebration of impact. But the, uh, the time that I was asked, we hadn't got that a few years ago now, and I was asked how big, and uh, I said, well, for instance, uh, of our preaching program, we have 6,000 graduates that they're just celebrating at the moment. And I was about to go on and they were saying, wow, that's incredible, 6,000 around the globe. And I said, no, the 6,000th graduate of our Indonesia program. Now, uh, the director of that program is Dwi, and it's going to be a privilege to introduce you to her. And she's chatting with Paul Windsor. And Paul is our global leader for our international preaching program. And Paul himself has recently moved from Bangalore uh, back to New Zealand. And Dwi is in uh, Indonesia, as I mentioned. So you can add another couple of time zones if, uh, again, you're keeping time. Over to them. Hi, Dwee. It's just you Hi. and me. Yes. <laughs> Dwee, you, you are uh, of a younger generation, one of the ones that has never met John yes. Stott. So how, did you, how did you get to know about him? What were some of the first ways in which you engaged with John Stott? I think I, I heard the name John Stott first time when I was in the university and I joined IFES. And then uh, I remember that was, uh, we studied from his commentary on the book of Rome. And then when I went to the university, then I, you know, get to know more about him. And I really like one particular book that, you know, it's become like a handbook for me right now. The mm -hmm. book called Issues Facing Christians Today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great book. So does that book have a, a particular 
life and purpose in the seminary where you're based? How, how has it uh, had an impact there? Yes, I think this book is kind of liberating for me because for a long time, uh, I have this kind of dichotomy view of Christianity, you know, uh, separation between what is secular and what is sacred. Uh, this book really helped me to see that everything is belong to God. And when I uh, started teaching at the seminary, I really want to uh, to change the uh, uh, the program study, you know, the, the MTH. Yeah, it was like, you know, pure systematic theology. And I really wanted to, you know, program study that really touched the real life in the society because of what John Stott wrote in the book. Now we have this uh, MTH, the program study where I become director, MTH in Transforming Culture and Society, based on John Stott book. That's incredible, isn't it? How, how his impact on the seminary and through the seminary to the wider culture, just, just through that solitary book, um, has been significant. Yeah. Um, what about, uh, you've, you've been involved in the Langham preaching program um, in Indonesia since the beginning, almost a decade now. It's when we first met. Um, I know now your role is not so much in, in Indonesia, but uh, in, in Asia more widely. But just for a moment, reflect on the, um, the landscape of the preaching program in, in Indonesia. Is there something that you can share in terms of a story of the impact that it's having in the life of a pastor or a congregation? Yes, I think uh, Langham preaching movement uh, came and it, um, yeah, it, it bring the uh, biblical preaching, you know, uh, even more stronger in Indonesia. And uh, I'm, I'm so excited that the people in Papua right now during the pandemic is really exciting to carry on this program. But more than just uh, biblical preaching, it's also influenced uh, somehow the mindset of, you know, the holistic mission. As I said, so it's not only in influencing the pulpit, but also the way the church do and carry on their program um, more now engage with the social issues. If I may give the example, like the um, the church in Sumatra uh, were really active. They are really active in Lion preaching. I think they are the key people from that church. They are doing a lot of things. I mean, before the Lion preaching as well, they have like, you know, a center for drug addict. They have housing for the volcano, you know, refugees. Yeah, mm -hmm. they have um, a lot of things going on in, in, in the church. But when we discuss or we talk about John Stott, it's kind of bring, bring them together between the, you know, evangelism and social work. It doesn't have something that is, has to be separate, but, you know, just, just to bind them together with, with this book, yeah. yeah. One of the distinctive features of the Indonesia work from how I see it is that the uh, preaching movement committee there in the country um, had memorandums of agreement with whole denominations, right? The entire denominations were involved in the, in the training. That's quite unique, I think, for our work around the world. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, that is something that is I'm also excited about because through the Langham preaching, we kind of bring together a unity or harmony or networking among so many different denominations that they never really worked together before. So I, one of the trainer here, he shared that, you know, before Langham preaching, I never really worked with someone outside my denomination. And now I'm a trainer. I can teach in, you know, these people Batak people at Batak Church and Torajan people, Torajan Church. Something that is really, um, I mean, it, when I heard that, it's really touched my heart. Like, yeah. but this is not only strengthening the pulpit, but it's also strengthening the society because yeah. of that. The, the, the yeah, the conflict, you know, it's become less, and yeah, it's it's, it's amazing. That was a big part of what John Stood Stott uh, represented was this integration of um, the evangelism and the and the social action. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, obviously you you started in the Indonesia work, but now you have a very 
significant role in the life of Langham preaching uh, with being the director of uh, Asia and the South Pacific, huge part of, of the world and of the, the preaching ministry. What um, excites you most about the, the vision for the future in terms of Langham preaching, particularly across Asia and the South Pacific, which is your main responsibility now? Also contributing something to the to the society, to the nations where mm. we are going, you know, because mm. I believe that from the, the Langham logic, you know, that, that we always <laughs> say, I add one, you know, uh, another, another aspect on it because Langham logic start with the church, but I started with the society. God wants mm. a society to be transformed and that transformation should start from the church that are maturing. And how the church maturing is from, you know, this, and we can continue from that. Um, do we, uh, part of the, the vision that John Stott uh, birthed and continues on through Langham Partnership are the three programs, the, the scholars program, the, the literature program, and the, the preaching program. Now you're one of these um, exciting people that um, is linked to all three. Yeah. Um, beyond your own personal story, and as you cast your eye around Indonesia and maybe parts of Asia, how, how do you see the, the three programs um, working together to enhance the impact uh, of what Langham is, is doing? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I think the three programs work together, supporting one another in a beautiful way. You know, for example, I mean, for sure, Langham preaching uh, will not complete without uh, literature. You know, we need books, we need resources to equip these pastors. Yeah, and we need we need a lot of them. And I'm glad that Langham literature also encourage the uh, the local writers to write in their own language, and that is really important. That's what we need. And you know, and we also need a scholar. To, to think through theologically, you know, and how this truth become relevant to the people in their country. So we need a scholar within the country. And that's what Langham scholar is doing, you know, just, you know, spotting the potential people within the country and then send them to provide education for them and they will come back. And It's often hard, um where I am say in New Zealand, where there are many uh, PhDs, it's even in one given uh, seminary, it, it, you sometimes lose sight of what a single PhD person, um, the impact they can have in a, in a country like Pakistan or Cambodia where theological education has, has not um, increased, but a, a, a single scholar can make a big difference, can't they? And what, what are your, your dreams and hopes in terms of the future development of uh, the Langham preaching work uh, in, in, in Indonesia and across Asia? Yes, Paul, my, my dream for, you know, future with Langham preaching is I want to see the Langham preaching movement will be, you know, carry on in everywhere across Asia, especially in the difficult country. I'm glad that we started, uh, you know, we'll, we'll start introduction session in East Timor, that is a new movement. And also uh, probably Bhutan, hopefully. Mm. Yeah, and I, yesterday I just got a, I've been emailing people if they know someone in Japan because I've been studying about Japan and I have heart for it. Mm. You know, hopefully, you know, in a, in a difficult country like that, that's, I want long I'm preaching to, be there and to to make an impact, you know, to empower and mm. yeah, and to support the pastor and to bring biblical preaching movement. Mm. And another one is I want to see more of the um, indigenous uh, literature that emerge yeah. within the context, yeah, you know, within you know from the Langham preaching or from the scholar or whatever. That's I really wanted to you know to start to be developed. Yeah, I know it's Indonesia probably have been translating a lot of books, 
but I want someone within the country to, to write something, but don't say it should be me, but <laughs> people need to write something, uh, you know, in Indonesia or in South Pacific. And any other any other dreams for the future that come to mind? Yeah, uh, I want there will be a leader like me emerge from this country. Yeah. And who knows, you know, someone like who, who, who will imagine someone from Asia, from Indonesia. Yeah. I was like in the little town Bandung and I was there. <laughs> yeah, but Langam preaching give me an opportunity and then like widen my horizon part. So I, I want something like that will happen again, you know, from within the Vietnam or Cambodia or, you know, that, that, that country. To see your story and, and your testimony uh, multiplied in, in the lives of others and yeah. the impact that that has. Yeah, uh, that's good for If you've kept with us so far, well done. And uh, we're now going to our last video. It's a pleasure and a privilege to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Chris Wright. Chris was commissioned directly by John Stott to continue the vision uh, that is Langham Partnership. And uh, he has recently uh, moved from being our international director to being Langham's global ambassador and ministry director. And he's been in most of the photographs uh, that we've seen so far, I think, that have had uh, Uncle John and Chris right by his side for many of them. Uh, Chris actually moving there is uh, making way and we look forward to welcoming Tayo Arikawe as our new international director who's starting this month. But let's hear from Chris. I wonder if you noticed what they have in common, those three interviews with our friends in India, Indonesia and Ukraine. Did you spot it? They all stress that in one way or another, the vision of Langham Partnership is to strengthen the mission of the church. And also how that missional focus was at the heart of the vision of John Stott himself and is still the most vital part of his legacy today. Taras from Ukraine told us about that community of 90 biblical scholars and writers in the Slavic, Russian-speaking regions of Europe and Eurasia who are modelling the unity of the church across ethnic and denominational divides with a clear missional focus, he said, for their whole region as they worked together to produce the Slavic Bible commentary. And Ashish from India insisted that scholars need to do their PhDs consciously aiming to resource the church's ministry and mission by following John Stott's example of double listening, listening to the word and to the world. And Dwi from Indonesia related how John Stott's book Issues Facing Christians Today inspired her to teach and train preachers with the mindset, she said, of holistic mission in society. In fact, I rather love the way that Dwi urged us to expand the so-called Langham logic. I don't know if you've heard about the Langham logic, but it's how John Stott used to explain the rationale behind all of Langham's work. We have three biblical convictions, he used to say, and one logical conclusion. And the first biblical conviction is that God wants his church to grow up to maturity, not just to grow bigger in numbers. And the second conviction is that God's church grows up to maturity through God's word. And the third, that God's word comes to God's people mainly through biblical preaching. So the logical question to ask, John Stott would continue, is what can we do to raise the standards of biblical preaching? And so that's why we do what we do in Langham. We are seeking to raise the standards of biblical preaching, whether through hands-on training in the biblical preaching movements in more than 80 countries around the world in Langham preaching, 
or through providing resources of good books to help preachers in the task of their preaching, uh, through Langham Literature, or through strengthening those institutions of theological education for future pastors and preachers by the ministry of now more than 300 Langham scholars. And all of this follows from that Langham logic that John Stott gave us. But behind all that stands a prior reason, as we rightly pointed out, and that is that God wants society to be changed. God has a purpose for the world, and that's why he called the church into existence. That's why God wants the church to grow up to maturity so that we can participate effectively and fruitfully in God's mission in the world. And so you see, behind the Langham logic, there stands what we might call the divine logic or the mission of God. That is, as the Apostle Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, that God's eternal purpose is to bring all things in heaven and earth into unity in and under Christ. And that's an agenda that embraces all nations and all cultures and all tribes and languages and indeed, as Paul says, all creation. So whatever mission we have, as individuals or as churches or as global organizations like Langham, our mission has to be seen within the scope and the scale of that vast mission of God for the world. So you see, rather than us struggling to make the Bible and the gospel relevant to the world, it's, it's really the other way around. That is that God is in the business of changing the world into the shape of the gospel in accordance with the great narrative drama of Scripture. For the Bible is the true story of the real world, and the Gospel is good news, God's good news for the destiny of the world, because of what God has done through the life and death and resurrection of His Son, Jesus of Nazareth. And our mission, our mission is simply to get with the program, God's program. Now, John Stott certainly believed all that. He was totally committed in his preaching and his teaching and writing and in founding organizations like Langham, totally committed to mission in all its integrated and holistic dimensions because he believed in the cosmic achievement of the cross of Christ and in the impact of the gospel on every dimension of human life on earth and indeed on the life of the earth itself. But you know, John Stott was not naively optimistic. He was not some kind of utopian dreamer or idealist thinking that we Christians will somehow be able to transform the whole world into the kingdom of God, as it were, all by ourselves. No, no, only God can do that. And only God will do that when Christ returns and the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. But in the meantime, John Stott did believe in the immense potential of Christian believers and Christian churches at local level to make a real difference in their surrounding context and culture. As Jesus said, his disciples are to be salt and light positively impacting their immediate environments of corruption and darkness. And that was a picture, salt and light, uh, of Christian discipleship and mission that John Stott liked to preach from quite often. But then you see, in order for believers to be truly effective agents of change in society, salt and light, as Jesus said, they need to be nourished. They need to be taught and equipped by God's Word so that they will grow in the depth of their understanding and in practical godly living and in faithful endurance in a hostile world. And that was the vision, the logic, in a sense, one might say, that energized John Stott and that still energizes the Langham Partnership and needs to go on energizing the church in the, in the future if we were to have any impact at all in line with God's mission for the world. You see, we, we urgently need, continuously need, to strengthen the ministry of the Word of God for the sake of the maturity of the church and 
for the sake of the mission of the church in the world. Or, to put it more simply, like John Stott, we want to see the Bible changing churches so that churches under God can change the world around them. And may that vision that inspired him, may that go on for years to come bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. Um, we're coming to the end of our of our call. Um, we'll be sending you an email over the next 24 hours and it will direct you to this uh, page on our website, um, uklangham.org uh, webinar. And on there, there'll be ways that you can carry on as, as Chris has just been sharing with us, how we can move this on for the next generation uh, by signing up to our e-news or our, our monthly prayer guide uh, to receive our Transform magazine, of course, to uh, give financially, and an amazing way to really support uh, Langham for the generations to come is to think about leaving uh, Langham uh, a legacy uh, in your will. And as a thank you uh, for being with us uh, today, uh, we'd love for you to download uh, two uh, booklets. One is our latest Transform magazine, which is a centenary special uh, all about John Stott and some of his teaching and writing in there and, uh, and other people writing about him. And also recently our preaching uh, team uh, uh, led by Wilfredo in, the, in South America has written this um, it's about 60 pages uh, PDF booklet that you can download um, and there's prayers there's poetry there's reflections uh, passed over the past year as they just pray in this time of pandemic uh, so please go to that link now uh, later on um, or we will email you that link so you can see that later uh, and two things there that uh, you'll be able to download um, so I shall close us in prayer let's pray Father God, uh, we thank you uh, for this time uh, and uh, just encourage us uh, to share the news that we've been hearing today. We thank you uh, for the vision that John Stott had uh, and that we've seen that flourish uh, and continue. Uh, and it's for us now, Lord, as we look forward for that vision and that work to continue. So, Lord, be with us as we do that. And we just thank you for this time. Lord, we just ask for a blessing on every single person on this webinar as we go about the rest of our day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take care, everyone. God bless. Bye-bye.